one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 80th episode of The Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of The Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways, such as our animated videos, graphic novels, and living history. Today, we have the unique honor of being joined by Zurab Japaridzi. Uh, I'm going to introduce him in a moment, but we are streaming live across multiple platforms. So type in your questions and comments, whether you are joining us on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, we'd love to get to as many of them as possible. So my guest today, joining me from Georgia, where it is 1 a.m. in the morning, so we're very, very uh, grateful for, for him to join us at this ungodly hour. He, uh, Zurab Japaridze, is currently uh, the, is a current Georgian parliament member. He's the leader of the Libertarian Party Girchi, which is more freedom. Um, along with being a lecturer of economics at the University of Georgia, Japaridze has been a longtime advocate for free markets and uh, the protection of individual liberties, notably standing against the Georgian mandatory military service law. So Zurab, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So, uh, to start with, in most Americans, we have a state in uh, our union uh, named Georgia. So when many Americans hear the word Georgia, they, they tend to think of that Southern state. So maybe if you could just for the uninitiated, uh, orient us and tell us a little bit about the history of your country um, and uh, it, its experience with, um, with under the Soviet Union and uh, bring us up to date. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Oh, Georgia is a really ancient country with a unique culture, unique uh, language. Uh, um, thousands of years um, Georgians uh, lived on this territory. It's, it's in the South Caucasus. Um, but then um, Georgia lost its independence and we were uh, for more than 200 years, Georgia was um, kind of occupied by Russian empire and then by Soviet Union by Bolsheviks, um, and we spent uh, 70 years uh, under the Soviet rule. And then uh, back in 1991, we got independence again. So now the uh, last 30 years, it's an uh, independent country. Uh, it's a country that strives uh, to become uh, again part of the West, uh, because historically we belong to the Western civilization. Uh, we aspire to become like uh, politically to become members of uh, NATO, uh, members of European Union. Um, but it's, it's a problematic uh, way to go. Um, so currently uh, we have um, lots of problems, lots of mostly economic problems and uh, problems associated with the security, um, uh, and I believe most of the problems are associated uh, or have roots in our Soviet past. And um, we, can, we can talk about all this. Yeah, so uh, how old were you? I mean, what is your memory of life under the, the Soviet Union? And um, what, was, what was your experience? Oh, I lived in Soviet Union for 15 years. I was 15 when Soviet Union collapsed. Um, well, um, Soviet Union was about, from my understanding, uh, it was a, a state or system based on um, slavery, basically. Um, there was no freedom. Uh, you know, uh, private property was prohibited in Soviet Union back in 1929, as far as I remember. Private trade was prohibited back in 1931. Uh, when talking about Soviet Union, um, people and scholars as well um, um, speak about uh, centrally planned economy and how prices were regulated and how the system did not work. But in fact, um, the whole life uh, of any person was uh, basically uh, regulated or planned by the state. So uh, when you were born in Soviet Union, uh, it was 
predetermine which uh, kindergarten you would go and then which secondary school you would go and then uh, you had you I mean it was predetermined you could you could have probably tried to get to other kindergarten or other school but it didn't make any sense because all kindergartens and all secondary schools were exactly the same uh, and then uh, you could have chosen uh, which university to go, but uh, there was a huge corruption to get in the university. But after the university, again, it was predetermined uh, which job you will get. And um, in most cases, uh, I cannot say the exact percentage, but maybe probably 80%, maybe 90% of cases, uh, the first job you will get, it was the job for your lifetime. You couldn't, couldn't change it. Uh, so everything that was planned and predetermined by the, uh, by the center, let's say so, you know, there was an institution called Gospla um, that planned basically everything in the country. So, um, yeah, and from, from many respects, it, it was a slavery. Um, and uh, of course it didn't work, the system didn't work. Uh, and um, that's why I believe it eventually it collapsed. It lasted for 70 years, but it was based on uh, terror, on uh, mass killing of people, and this is how, this is how it sustained for um, 70 years. But then, um, yeah, then it collapsed mostly, I believe, for economic reasons. Um, yeah, that, that's my memory. I mean, I, I, I usually when I teach um, economics or political ideologies to my students, uh, um, I usually bring an example that now if you go to supermarket in, in Tbilisi, which is the capital of Georgia, um, and I ask question, can you name all the products or items that you can buy at the supermarket? And they laugh because it's just impossible. But right. I, even though I was only 15 years old when Soviet Union collapsed, even now I can name all the items that were sold in Soviet type supermarkets because there were so few and there was no choice that I exactly remember every product that was sold in the supermarket. Um, yeah, it, it was a it was a horrible um, state, uh, evil empire, as uh, President Reagan called it. That's the exact name for this kind of uh, state. So you grew up to become uh, really the leading proponent of, of free market reforms uh, in your country, and your reputation has has grown beyond your your country. You, you've mentioned that your parents like many others in uh, their generation, even despite all of these deprivations um, and heavy handed policies of mm -hmm. uh, authoritarianism, but that in some respect, they, they bought into the narratives mm -hmm. of socialism and, and communism. So mm -hmm. what was your inspiration to see things differently? Was it just observing how terrible things were or you know, was it uh, a book or a teacher or mm -hmm. a particular writer or a film that um, that really awakened you to see things so so radically differently and, and promote a different way? Yeah, it's it's, it's a problem with the uh, older generation in general. Um, I um, quite often bring example of my parents and my discussions with them and me trying to convince them that what they believed in all their life, uh, it's not right. Um, it's, it's, this is not how uh, normal societies uh, work and live. Um, but it, 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 their, their mentality is the product of the Soviet uh, education system, let's say. So it, it, was, it was not an education system. It was more like indoctrination system. And um, there was no freedom of speech. And there were only very few sources of information for a Soviet citizen to get any information at all. This is a couple of newspapers and just two TV channels, uh, one in Georgia and one in Russia, if you live in Georgia. Um, so all these people were basically brainwashed for tens of years. And uh, those who resisted the system, they were just annihilated. Uh, they were either killed or sent to Siberia and died there. Um, so it's, it's really difficult because it goes to deeply to the face. I mean, they believe in something all their life and then you come with a hammer and try to basically destroy everything they believe in. And it's not an easy job. Um, this is why I always bring an example with my parents um, because uh, I, I've spent years 
argue with them. And I managed basically uh, to eventually convince them uh, about some of the um, some of their beliefs that they are wrong, but um, to completely convince them that uh, it was all evil, um, it was impossible for me. Um, but how my uh, world do changed? Uh, uh, I started to work at one of the uh, state institutions uh, back in nineties uh, after we got independence, and um, it was uh, fully, it was one of the most corrupt institutions in the country. Uh, and uh, I was I was young at the time, and I started to think. Uh, that uh, how, how is it possible? Uh, it's not normal. Uh, and uh, my, my, the first question in my mind was that how you can build a society on one kind of rules and what kind of morality so that it does not become like this. Uh, and when I started to ask these kind of questions to myself, I started to search for the answers. And um, um, first book that uh, changed, uh, I would say, my worldview was a book by uh, Hayek, uh, his, his last book, The Fatal Conceit. Uh, I got a PDF version of it because you could not have bought it here, but somehow I got it in the internet and I read it. And uh, it, it's a quite, uh, quite complicated language and quite difficult to read book. But still, I got the idea that this is, this is, it's, um, this is this something wrong in a society. And uh, then I started to search for other books, and I got I got Ayn Rand, I got Milton Friedman, I got uh, Henry Hazlitt on economics. I got lots of uh, lots of uh, people uh, who uh, wrote about uh, about freedom, how free society works, uh, why free economy is important and things like that. So I got interested into more economic issues and I read lots of economic books. Um, and uh, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, quite soon actually, I became a uh, libertarian. And then uh, uh, I started to look for uh, other thinkers or authored um, socialists basically, or communists. Uh, I tried to search for the arguments against the ideas uh, I become, became a believer in. So I read <laughs> other uh, minded uh, authors as well, including uh, Marx or but lots of other people would say so. Um, searching for um, arguments that might change my worldview, but I could not find any. Um, so uh, I'm a libertarian for over now more than 15 years uh, and uh, um, yeah and then I started to um, speak out um, first it was really difficult I mean beginning of uh, 2000 in this country um, sometimes it felt like I was crazy because it was even for me even difficult to convince my close friends that um, um, this is uh, how we should build a society and that freedom is the most important thing um, and then I argued with my friends, with my parents, with my colleagues at my works, and I changed jobs uh, lots of times. Um, but it was really difficult. Now, now it's a lot easier. There are, there are uh, tens of thousands of people uh, who, uh, who got the idea. And uh, yeah, some of them are Randians, uh, some of them are, some of them like, like, I don't know, Chicago school economists, some of them uh, choose like public choice school of economics, some of them are Austrian school economists, some of them are anarcho-capitalists and so on. But there are uh, lots of people who got the idea of liberty, um, who understand what Soviet Union was, uh, because uh, now we have a new generation of young people who were born uh, in independent country, and um, they have no understanding whatsoever what Soviet Union was. The problem is that still uh, in our education system, we don't actually teach what Soviet Union was, why wow. socialism is bad. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a huge problem. Um, and um, socialistic ideas are attractive here as well as uh, anywhere in the world. If you mm -hmm. don't teach and if you don't explain what your past was and uh, why that system doesn't work, we face uh, same problem as probably you'll face uh, in US as the people believe that, oh, that was not a real socialist, but real socialism is actually possible and we should build it and something like that. So that's very briefly my story, how I got here. Interesting, well, I, I think, um... 
others would do well to take a few pages from your story. I particularly enjoy your relating how you read not just Ayn Rand and Hayek and Friedman, uh, but that you read the arguments against them. Um, and uh, it goes to you know the, the saying that a, a man is, is really not well educated if he only knows one side of, of the argument. So I, I thought that was, um, that was something that uh, others should, should emulate. Um, and I, I, I would say that, yes, there is the issue of uh, not teaching history um, in terms of allowing other people to just repeat it and not be aware of what has worked and what hasn't worked. But, but even in the United States, although our, our government schools uh, are perhaps unsurprisingly also perpetuating arguments for more government. Um, I think it goes beyond just uh, the economics. It's really a question of the morality and, and going back to what you were saying about <clears throat> socialism as, as slavery, um, that it's, uh, it's even if it did work, which it hasn't and, and never will, it still would be immoral because uh, it denies self-ownership self-determination so. and, and basic <laughs> property rights. So um, is in what ways is the Georgian experience similar to, to other former satellite states, now independent states, or even other parts you know, of uh, Soviet Russia proper per se? Um, is, it, is the experience similar or is there something unique about the Georgian experience? Um, yeah, I would agree with you that um, at the end of the day, eventually it's a question of morality. Uh, and that's true. And the um, Soviet system actually built uh, different types of uh, morality. Uh, I call it, I mean, there, there are two dimensions that uh, I, I, I'd like to explain. One is that uh, in during Soviet times, uh, uh, people have uh, kind of a dual morality. One morality was uh, inside the family and the other morality was uh, in the public uh, life. In their private life, in their families, inside the families, people were more moral, I would say but they had to act differently outside in their public life because they had to be accustomed to the system because otherwise system would, would have destroyed them. Um, and uh, that still exists, unfortunately, in this country. Um, and the second thing, yes, I mean, during Soviet times, as I said, uh, private property was, uh, was prohibited. So it was a shame to, have, to, to own something. Uh, and even those people, uh, the Soviet elite who actually were rich by that time, they had to hide um, their uh, uh, symptoms or signs of uh, richness. Um, it was a crazy time. Um, and then, yeah, it, it, was, it was prohibited to trade. Uh, and the people who, um, found some ways, uh, very seldom, but still to import some stuff from the West and to sell it inside the Soviet Union, like, like uh, jeans, for example, or like some food fear. Uh, uh, and it was expensive, of course, but still some people managed to do it. Um, they, they were like shamed by the, by the state. They were, they were arrested uh, for that just for trading something, nothing else. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, or, or, or to, to uh, lend the money to someone for a certain interest. Uh, it was also a shameful uh, act. And we still have it even now uh, in this country after 30 years uh, since Soviet Union is collapsed. Uh, it is still believed that if a person is successful, uh, and by successful, I mean that he, he, he's got money, but he's successful. He has not um, stolen it from somewhere. He earned it. Um, still, uh, people consider it to be uh, shame or to, uh, to be a banker, for example. 
in this country. Um, it's shameful because uh, people don't like for some somebody lends some money and gets some interest on that. Um, so yeah, it, it's a question of morality. What 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 moral is what what you believe is right and what you believe is wrong, uh, and it's it's all messed up um, even now in this country. Uh, and going back to the to your question, um, whether Georgia's experience is similar to other. Uh, Soviet republics, let's say so. It, it is it is quite similar. I mean, I think uh, the only different experience uh, had uh, so-called Baltic states uh, because they chose a uh, different path uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. Because um, I think the main reason is that Georgia, well, Georgia and other uh, so-called Soviet republics were occupied for about seventy years, but Baltic states were occupied for about uh, what was it? For less like 40 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and there was still a generation in Baltic state who remembered independent uh, Estonia or Lithuania or Latvia, and they still had this sense of uh, private property um, or a sense of what capitalism is. And um, I think uh, after Soviet Union collapse, they had a better understanding what kind of country they wanted to build. Uh, this is something that we didn't have. And uh, I remember this uh, movement of independence and I remember all the politicians who were active at that time who actually brought independence to this country, uh, what they spoke about and all they wanted is just independence from Russia. And they believe that once we are independent, well, then everything will be fine. Um, but um, yeah, it appears that it's not true. Uh, and they had no understanding of uh, how society should be built including what kind of morality the society should have. And then it goes even further, what kind of economic uh, rules you should have, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, similarities with other republics, but I think the uh, only uh, countries, uh, these are Baltic states who actually chose a better way. Interesting, interesting. And, and uh, that you attribute that to the fact that they, you know, were sort of deprived of the oxygen of freedom for for less time, yeah. uh, that at, at some point you just completely lose any any memory um, or muscle memory of what it's like to be to be free. Now we've got a lot of good questions streaming in. I want to encourage those watching, go ahead, um, type them in. I we are going to get to to uh, as as many if not all of them. So hit us up. Uh, but before I turn to the questions, I, I wanted to turn also to the experience after independence, because Georgia became really a leading example of uh, free market prosperity uh, and, and then sort of uh, lost, lost its step along the way. So just tell us a little bit about what was the experience um, and, and what led to that kind of Georgian miracle during those oh, years. Uh, yeah, I mean, that started in, back in uh, 2003 when uh, we had a um, so-called Rose Revolution. There was a change mm -hmm. in government. Um, uh, before 2003, as I mentioned, uh, it, it was uh, basically uh, the Soviet Georgia again, even though we got independence uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, society, in terms of uh, management style or in, ter in terms of governance nothing actually changed. So the, uh, all the assets um, that exist in this country uh, still was owned by the state. Even now, uh, we, we did lots of good reforms um, during a certain period of time. Even now, almost 80% of all the assets is still owned by the state. Wow. So we got independent no country, idea. but yeah, how, how you, you cannot talk about free market or uh, capitalism uh, in, in a country where uh, basically all the assets is owned by the state, like lots of land. Uh, we have, I mean, uh, the almost, almost uh, around 40% of the area in Georgia is a forest and to, it's, it's prohibited to privatize the forest even now at this moment. Uh, all the minerals, all the mines, uh, it's owned by the state. Uh, and because of that, the uh, market uh, still doesn't work uh, in this country. But before 2003, I mean, it was all state. We, we still had some price controls. Uh, lots of areas in the economy were uh, still planned uh, centrally. Uh, we had lots of subsidies um, 
going to different areas of economy. Uh, and because we have lots of regulations, uh, enormous amount of regulations, and because of these regulations, we basically uh, had um, shortage of electricity, shortage of, shortage of supply of natural gas, um, oh, lots of huge economic problems and, and um, poverty, etc. But But then we had this Rose Revolution, which was basically a movement against corruption. Uh, and then uh, what happened is that we got a uh, guy, uh, Kaha Ben Dukidze, uh, who uh, was a guy who left Georgia uh, beginning of 90s or maybe end of 80s. Uh, and then he lived, he lived in Russia uh, and um, he's got lots of businesses there and he, he became rich. And uh, after Rose Revolution, uh, he decided to come to Georgia, and he he was a uh, he was a libertarian. He called himself a pragmatic libertarian, but he was a libertarian. He believed in small government, lower taxes, less regulations, uh, as limited government as possible. Um, and then uh, he became a minister of economy. He's got an offer from the uh, president Saakashvili uh, at the time, and he's got an offer to lead the reforms. He he used to tell the stories that he attended one of the presentations of the new government and. And then um, he approached the uh, president and told him that all these things that you talked about during the presentations, all these uh, reforms, so-called reforms, might be good for a country in uh, like an Eastern European country that is uh, already more or less developed. But for a country like Georgia, uh, uh, you need more dramatic reforms. Uh, and then Saakashvili agreed to that. So he became minister of economy and... Uh, he did, um, uh, I mean, he, what he did, it's, it's just, it was just impossible to consider this kind of reforms is possible in a country like Georgia. So we had like, uh, nobody, nobody knew at the time how many taxes we had. I mean, some economists calculated that we had like 20 war taxes, some of them said 22, 23, but we had more than 20 different types of taxes. Uh, so tax burden was really high. Uh, most of people do not pay those taxes, but they just paid bribes to the tax collectors. Uh, so he reduced the number of taxes down to five. Uh, wow. We had, yeah, we had uh, about uh, 900 uh, licenses and permits uh, you need to obtain to start or do some kind of business. So he reduced it down to 300. So we eradicated almost two thirds of the regulations and permits and things like that. Uh, he was instrumental in. Uh, uh, the regulation the regulating the energy sector and uh, uh, this was the first time we got electricity for 24 7 uh, after this deregulation uh, he got rid of all the price control almost all the price control because we still have um, regulated um, tariff for electricity uh, uh, and we, we still have some some prices regulated but very few so most of the prices were um, of the regulations. Um, and um, even though that by that time, lots of uh, Georgian experts and economists predicted that if you get rid of all the taxes and all the regulations, uh, there will be no uh, money coming to the state budget and we will not be able to finance uh, the costs the uh, government has, etc. Actually what happened is uh, in, uh, from 2003 till 2012, uh, our, our economy grew uh, immensely. Uh, and uh, in 2000, uh, what was it, 2007, we had a two digit economic growth. It was uh, up to 13%. And uh, in spite of lots of problems we faced during these years, and I can mention those problems, we had a war with Russia in 2008. We had a Russian embargo on uh, electricity and gas supply starting from 2006. We had, uh, and Russia, Russia was an, our main uh, trade partner uh, coming from the Soviet times. Uh, we had full embargo on transportation with Russia. And this all happens during this time period. We still had uh, about uh, six, uh, seven percent economic growth on average during this period to, from 2003 until uh, 2012. And this is solely because of this deregulation, reduced reduction of taxes and this kind of reforms. Um, so in, by, during this time of period, Georgia became a, uh, as this is a World Bank nominated number one reformer um, in, the, uh, in the world. Um, and we got the, 
I think it was a eighth or ninth position on uh, World Bank ranking of easy of doing business uh, because you can register a business just in one day here, even now. Um, so we did we did some good reforms and we had some good results. But then um, lots of those reforms were actually reversed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And and what do you attribute that to? It, it sounds like uh, you know the the government started picking and choosing who were going to be the approved industrialists, uh, and so the kind of the corruption came came back. Uh, well, I think again it goes back to to uh, to morality or to mentality. Um, Unfortunately, um, and this is what, what Kaha used to say, Kaha ben Dukita, who did all these reforms, who was behind these reforms, that he had no time uh, for explanations. So he was busy with uh, doing all these reform, reforms, but he had no time to actually explain what he was doing and why he was doing so. He had no time to explain why lower taxes are better, mm -hmm. why, why it's better when government has less money and spends less and uh, people have more money and people decide on what to spend this money, why it is, why it is wrong to have a so-called nanny state and it's better to have a free society and things like that. So uh, he had no time for that, that's what he said. So this is why when he was out of the government, he actually started the university called Free University of Tbilisi, where he actually started to actually educate new generation about all these issues. And this university even now still ranks number one in this country. Um, so uh, what I believe has happened is that uh, people uh, did not actually um, and still they don't understand the connection between those reforms and the economic development we got because of those reforms. Uh, and even now you will find lots of people in Georgia uh, and who will tell that uh, we have like 24 seven electricity now because of those reforms. And they will just tell you now it just, I mean, it's 21st century, everybody has electricity. So it's just time passed and we got electricity, something like that. So they don't really see this connection. Uh, unfortunately, it's a problem. This is why uh, when, when I and my friends uh, started this movement, uh, we spent probably 80% uh, of our time on actually educating people. Uh, we, we just don't say that like lower taxes is good. We try to explain why lower taxes are better and why it works better and why it's going to be better for everyone and things like that. And um, yeah, we did, we did, uh, we, we, we do, we did, uh, we translated hundreds of videos, including videos of Ayn Rand, uh, lots of videos on economic issues, uh, explaining different aspects, explaining why, why, I mean, there are videos about morality, about justice, about economics, but um, we try to actually make, uh, especially young generation, understand why what we say uh, is the right thing and what others say uh, is not right to do. Well, um, and we at the Atlas Society have been thrilled to be a part of that in, in a small way. We were contacted by Iraqi Iyag Iyagarashvili, uh, who has translated, I think we're, we're up to five of our animated videos. And for anybody else watching who's interested uh, in being a part of a, a coalition and a partnership um, between the Atlas Society and Georgia, we have a lot of uh, resources and pocket guides and um, graphic novels, uh, and of course our videos and our social media, um, all of which could be, could be translated. So we're open for partnership. Uh, all right, well, we're gonna get to some of these questions that have been streaming through. Um, one is coming from YouTube, Scott, is asking about South Ossetia, mm -hmm. is uh, now lost as a Russian client state or might Georgia get it back somehow? Yeah, we have um, about 20% of our uh, Georgian territory occupied by Russia, even now. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's, Ab it's Abkhazia and uh, Srinwali region, uh, which is sometimes called so Sasetia. Uh, and uh, there are Russian troops based there. Uh, so um, 
the only way I believe uh, is uh, to get those people and then those uh, territories back uh, is to build a free society here. Uh, free society is, uh, is the only uh, way forward. It's, it's the only solution to have a, a true digital economic growth. Uh, what I believe is uh, in that we need to create a contrast, a huge difference uh, about uh, how people live on unoccupied parts of this country and then how people live in occupied parts. And um, the example I bring up with my students all the time when they ask similar question to me is the example of Soviet Union. During Soviet times, the borders of the Soviet Union were, were closed, but still uh, people were trying to get out of the Soviet Union and get basically to the West and thousands of people died actually on the Berlin Wall. And uh, they were moving uh, to the West uh, just because there was more freedom there and they wanted to live a free life. Uh, and of course, uh, with, with, with more freedom comes, comes with more prosperity. So what, uh, what I believe is that uh, uh, the moment when we can say that we are getting those territories and those people back is when people actually start moving from those territories toward Georgia and uh, Russians will try to stop them. Uh, same way as Russian troops tried, tried to stop uh, those people who were climbing the Berlin Wall uh, during the Soviet times. And that's when we get those people in those territories back. We have a question from Instagram. Uh, David is asking, is corruption still a major issue in Georgia today or uh, has the freeing up of the economy helped with that? No, it helped a lot. Uh, I mean, when you have, uh, when you have uh, less regulations, uh, when people um, want to start business or enlarge their business so and they have they don't need to go to lots of different government agencies to get permits and some kind of letters etc etc so there you you're basically reducing the contact between a citizen and the state agencies and there are fewer chances of corruption um, same goes with the money if you give uh, less money to the government to spend, uh, there will be less money to actually steal from there. So um, we, we don't have the so-called petty corruption now, uh, but we, uh, I think government is still collecting lots of money uh, from our pockets and we are spending, our government spending is about um, 32, 33% of uh, GDP, uh, something similar to what in the US you have, yeah. but for a poor country like well, Georgia, just jump way ahead of you on, on that with some of the, the current uh, spending <laughs> bills that are being proposed by this yeah, administration. I, I, but. I think it's a lot. I think it's a lot, it's too much. So, uh, and of course, when government spends this money using tenders or auctions or whatever, um, yeah, there, there are some, some businesses or, or businesses who are uh, close to the government or the party in government and uh, yeah they're getting there they're stealing lots of lots of money uh, so we have this kind of corruption and then the other type of corruption is uh, certain types of privileges that uh, businesses or different organizations uh, get uh, from the government um, so yeah I mean uh, in a country like Georgia, uh, in a poor country like Georgia, especially, uh, and the uh, economic situation actually um, matters. Um, uh, yeah, you have these kind of problems. Uh, we have another question coming in from Instagram. Tammy Z uh, asks something I was wondering about myself. How hard was it for the Georgian economy to shift from producing mostly tea during the USSR to what it does today. So just the background is that uh, in terms of central planning, the Soviet Union decided, Georgia, you're gonna be the tea producing uh, satellite state. And, um, but in fact, uh, it wasn't, the climate wasn't particularly suited for, for producing tea. It was just a, a bureaucrat's command. Um, and so afterwards there wasn't, this uh, this direction and there wasn't these subsidies to do that. So, yeah, what was what was that process? 
Um, I'm not sure about the climate. I think climate might be good for producing okay. CT, but during Soviet times, there was no... Uh, no better place to produce tea uh, because it's, it's a, Georgia is a southern part uh, bordering with uh, Turkey. So uh, most probably it was the best climate in the only Soviet territory where you could produce the tea. But you know, Soviet market was a closed market. So there was uh, uh, the pro tea produced in Georgia was uh, sold throughout the Soviet Union. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Georgia was producing like 95% of tea that was sold in um, Soviet Union. But the quality of the tea was really bad because uh, there was no competition uh, and uh, the tea production was uh, it, it was a, a state-owned production so nobody there were there were no incentives actually to uh, to think about the quality uh, because it did not really matter so what was sold throughout georgia i don't think it was tea actually i mean <laughs> god knows what the, what it was mixed with because people were making money with it uh, and those who were in charge of this production the soviet bureaucrats they were quite rich so almost, uh, I mean, most of the uh, western part of Georgia was a tea producing. There were three regions, at least, uh, that was producing the tea. And uh, the funny thing is that uh, right before the collapse of the Soviet Union, where we are uh, striving for our independence, most of the Georgians actually believe that uh, once we get rid of uh, Russian occupation, we can just sell tea and uh, just by selling tea, we can actually live quite well. <laughs> but then Soviet Union collapsed and of course nobody wanted Georgian tea because um, even in Georgia, tea was imported from India, from Sri Lanka and from, from other countries and people actually tasted the real tea taste and nobody wanted Georgian tea. So it was a huge problem. Uh, even now, after 30 years, if you go to the western part of Georgia, you will still see lots of land areas, huge land areas, where these tea bushes still exist. I mean, nobody takes care of them and it's, it's quite expensive as far as I know to get rid of those bushes, but you will see those remains of, of this Soviet time there. But it's not only about uh, tea production. I mean, Soviet Union, because, so, because there were no price system during the Soviet times and um, I don't know if you know that, but Soviet Union used to send uh, some spies uh, to the uh, Western countries. Uh, I read about Berlin, actually, to the, to the part of the Berlin that was not uh, occupied by, by Soviet Union. And those spies were just uh, wandering around in supermarkets there, looking at the prices of the products and then coming back and telling this uh, ghost plan that like, for example, butter, one kilogram of butter is sold for this price and one kilogram of uh, wheel is sold uh, meat for this price, etc. And this is how they were coming up with the prices that the, for the products in the Soviet Union because they had because there was no private properties, there was no price system and they should have come up from somewhere with the prices. And this whole system was uh, built so uh, all those Soviet republics were somehow connected with each other. So there was no economic rational behind that. And because of that, uh, lots of uh, uh, production facilities and plants we had in Georgia, um, after collapse of the Soviet Union, they did not know where to sell their product because there was no demand for their product and the quality was bad, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we still have uh, lots of problems because of that. Okay, we've got a question on YouTube. Scott asking, what do Georgians think of Biden so far? So asking about, you know, whether they're, the, the change in administration, presidential administration, um, has any influence or impact? Is it at all relevant to what goes on inside Georgia? Uh, well, I, I believe most of Georgians are um, so occupied with their problems locally here that they don't really think much about, um, about international um, um, relations okay. of, of this country or what's happening outside of Georgia. But those who are uh, interested in politics in general, interested in uh, geopolitics in our region, uh, of course, they, they pay lots of attention to what happens in US. And US is, uh, is a strategic partner for this country. And the uh, US is uh, um, 
basically one of the main uh, pillars of uh, Georgia's uh, security at this moment. Uh, and um, as for this current administration, um, where there are some, some Georgians who did not like Trump administration, that uh, they like any administration <laughs> as far as there is no Trump administration. Uh, but um, if you look at um, people who pay attention to what kind of uh, policies uh, US administration has both internally and externally, I would say that uh, they don't really favor Biden administration. So they don't like some socialistic policies Biden administration has uh, in US and um, they see it, uh, that those kind of policies will make US weaker in a long run and uh, um, based on the fact that we uh, associate our security with U.S. being stronger, uh, those people don't really like that. Uh, but also in terms of international relations, what we see now is the Biden administration um, do not show much interest to, to the South Caucasus region. And uh, we feel it. And uh, yeah, we don't, we don't really like it. Understood. Yeah. So essentially, given that there is a, a, a strong uh, alliance and, and uh, a, a looking to the United States uh, as an ally for your security and also perhaps, you know, ideologically looking for uh, an America that's going to be standing up for, for freedom and for property rights and for uh, for capitalism, that, that it's not necessarily a positive um, development. Okay, um, a question here for also from uh, YouTube, Dea De La Vrenti, um, is asking about vaccine mandates, passports, those kinds of things, which I, I guess maybe we're just to be taking a step back and asking, uh, you know, there's been a lot of different approaches in, um, in mm. Europe, in Scandinavia, in other parts of the world. Uh, what has the experience um, of Georgia been in terms of the pandemic? And um, also what is what is the, the response been? Where does it kind of fall on the, the spectrum between sort of a, a, uh, a focused protection of, of just the elderly with letting most other people uh, manage their own risk um, or kind of going to the opposite of extreme of, of lockdowns and, and mandates and, and uh, yeah. mandatory vaccines. Yeah, Dea is actually my friend. She, she moved to US a number of years ago. She lives, she lives in LA right. now. Um, and she's always interested what's what's going on uh, here in Georgia. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we had a, a terrible situation uh, last year. Um, current government actually used this pandemic for their political uh, purposes uh, to basically get more control over people's lives. Uh, and they portrayed it as if they're taking care of people. So they introduced lots of regulations and um, I, I violated a number of them in, on purpose and uh, I, I got about 6,000 large fines for that. Um, but what happened is that, yeah, they, they just used it for your political purposes, uh, telling people that we need to do, uh, we need to introduce this kind of some really crazy regulations that has, um, I mean, if you have a common sense, you will not find any link how those regulations would have stopped virus from spreading, um, including like you could not walk uh, outside, just walking was prohibited on a, on a free, on a, on a fresh air um, and things like that. Uh, and then uh, last year we had a parliamentary elections uh, in October and they use this uh, pandemic situation basically um, to, uh, to get more votes. I mean, last year uh, they took a debt of 7.5 billion, which is uh, a record in Georgia's history. And uh, they spent last year more money than the year before when there was no crisis um, just to get votes. And now what you see is that uh, lots, we, are, we are number one in terms of uh, deaths uh, per million population. If you, if you look, at, look at the statistics, so all those regulations uh, um, had no uh, purpose at all. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, now they're introducing uh, this uh, 
green passports, so-called green passports. So they're kind of doing some kind of a segregation of the population. So if you are vaccinated, you can enter certain places. If you are not vaccinated, um, I mean, you cannot do it, uh, which we are against, of course. I mean, if it's if it's uh, done by the owner of, uh, of a restaurant, for example, then it's fine with me. But I don't think it's a government job to introduce this kind of a blanket regulations for the whole country. Um, but still, they are doing it, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, as for the mandatory vaccinations, uh, fortunately, we don't have it, even though there were some discussions about that. Um, as far as I see now, uh, the government is not going to do that, which is good. Well, so... Uh... I guess the, the situation is um, typical and very unfortunate in terms of it being uh, exploited by more authoritarian elements within the government to make changes to election laws, to try to uh, tilt things in, in their, their favor, which we, we also saw here in the United States, um, as well as um, using it as a pretext, using the pandemic as a pretext for, uh, for greater controls or yeah. saying uh, different groups can have privileges and others can't. So that's, yeah. uh, that's unfortunate. And no, it also will not help with your, uh, your economic growth and economic liberalization. Yeah, of course. No, it's, it's a, I see it as a huge problem because, um, I mean, it's, it's a classical game in politics. You, you, find a, you find some kind of a threat and then uh, you, you use the threat to get more control over people's lives. Once government gets more control over people's lives, then it's, it's always very difficult to get uh, that freedom back. Well, I want to also remind people next week, we're going to be uh, bringing back my dear friend, Jeffrey Tucker. Um, he's, he's now started the Brownstone Institute, and he has been uh, the leading voice speaking out against the, uh, first and foremost, just pure irrationality of the response to a virus, and um, then also the uh, the immorality of the authoritarian controls um, documenting the destruction that they've that they've uh, wrecked. So please uh, mark your calendars and come back and join us next week. Another question here um, from looks like it's coming in from Jacob uh, on Instagram. I think what is the best way to teach young people the evils of socialism uh, when they cannot even imagine a society um, like the one that you, you grew up under? So uh, is it books? Is it um, videos? Is it, uh, what, what, how, how, what's your teacher? So what's your experience with the best means? Um. Well, I, I don't know what is the most effective way, but I can speak only about uh, my experience and the experience me and my friends have in our movement. Uh, we, uh, because of the lack of the resources, uh, we decided that the main communication for us would be social media. And mm -hmm. uh, okay. Facebook is the most popular social media platform in Georgia, and it's even get, get becoming more and more popular. So, um, we don't, we don't uh, use uh, Twitter much. Uh, Instagram became popular among uh, youngsters. Uh, now TikTok became also popular, but still the Facebook is the main platform for discussions. And uh, what we did is, uh, well, I mean, we, we didn't know uh, what strategy would work. So we basically started to try everything. So I can tell you- I heard you about what, that. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you what, 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 what actually worked and we try, we still try to use it. Um, uh, we, we usually do something, uh, something crazy um, from the point of view of the Georgian public. And then we explain why we do that. For example, you mentioned in, in your introductions that uh, we are proponent, I'm a proponent of, uh, uh, I'm against of the mandatory military conscription yeah so we 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 uh, we knew that uh, lots of young people were drafted every year but they were not even taken to to military service they were just used as a free labor to guard some government buildings or some prisons etc um 
And then, uh, and it was a huge problem. We we decided to somehow somehow find a solution. So we uh, looked uh, through the law and found that uh, if you are a priest, uh, they actually cannot draft you. Um, and so we started our own religion, and uh, we made uh, priests uh, tens of thousands of young people. Uh, and uh, because. I love it. Uh, yeah, because Georgian society is very religious, or at least uh, they they claim that they are religious, uh, uh, they were against it. But then we started to explain why we are doing it. So we explained that um, it's a matter of freedom for us. I mean, if you want to somebody to do something, uh, you should pay for this, and you have nobody has any right to take one year or two year of uh, young uh, man's uh, life and to make him to do um, some work uh, and it works. Uh, and uh, we do this kind of uh, stuff all the time. For, for example, when uh, yeah, now now the discussion about prohibiting some gambling and uh, most probably in the nearest future, we will start our online gambling company. company. And uh, we always have a fight because of this with the government and uh, quite often we are arrested. You know, they make us pay some fines even though we don't pay and then they create problems with our bank accounts, etc. But it's it's uh, for us, it's, it became kind of a way of life. But each time we do this kind of thing, we explain why we are doing it. And, uh, you, you know, when, when you do this kind of stuff, you have a kind of a window of opportunity, a time span when you are in the center of attention and you can use this time to do educational work, to explain something. Because otherwise, I mean, you can deliver lectures, but nobody's listening. But once you are in the center of attention, you can actually explain why you are behaving so strange. I mean, strange <laughs> by the standards of the Georgian society. And it works. I mean, in 21st century, uh, it's a problem for anyone to get in the center of attention. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are in show business or in politics or wherever. So you, you can... You can talk about lots of wise stuff, but if nobody's listening, it doesn't matter. So uh, this is a strategy that works for us. Uh, we do something crazy, and then for a short period of time, we do lots of explanations. And this is how uh, we made lots of young people understand what we believe in. So uh, kind of a guerrilla marketing approach, high on creativity, imagination, thinking outside the box and creating uh, a splash, you know, a kind of a stunt and then using it as an opportunity to educate. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, well, we are coming right up on the top of the hour. I'm going to squeeze in a last question um, by Erica, uh, who is on Instagram. She's asking, if you're helping young people avoid mandatory conscription, do you agree then it is better to follow morality in the face of an unjust law? Um, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, but this, uh, I mean, uh, we do not uh, follow all the laws we have in Georgia because we believe that lots of those laws are unjust laws and we publicly violate them. So, and we call it um, civil disobedience acts and we committed this kind of acts a number of times. And uh, um, initially it was a problem to explain why, uh, why we are doing it and how is it possible not to follow the law. Um, but then we brought uh, lots of examples and uh, yeah, we, we just, whenever we, we, we had lots of TV debates on that issue, whether uh, a citizen should follow all the existing laws or so citizens should go against those laws whom he or she deems um, unjust. And uh, we bring up the examples of, uh, for example, of apartheid in South Africa, which was completely legal, or slavery was legal, or mm -hmm. Holocaust was uh, legal, completely legal. Uh, and then they understand that, yeah, sometimes uh, there are some laws that are unjust, sometimes even horrible. Uh, and then uh, we believe that it becomes obligation of a, of a uh, citizen with a, with a moral uh, to go against those laws. Uh, and um, it works. We, we, I don't think we're going to be able to get to a full uh, answer on this, but I, I thought it was an interesting observation uh, from Tornike Umash 
Uman Koshvili, uh, saying being in a post-Soviet uh, country, he is saying that um, where, where is it important to draw the line between the amount of freedom in terms of a country's social policies? He, he's, his observation is that um, there is a big emphasis on freedom, but he would like to see uh, more of an emphasis on individual responsibility. So. Um, well, um, it's a million dollar question, but yes. uh, I mean, uh, this is how I see it, and uh, this is uh, how I act, I would say. Uh, in a country like Georgia, a post-Soviet country, um, yeah, I mean, we, we can, if, if I was a member of academia, I would uh, argue, um, and I would spend lots of time on arguing where this line should be drawn. And uh, I consider myself to be uh, a classical liberal. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and it's, it's quite interesting for me to see, for example, Randians debating anarcho-capitalists or Chicago school economists debating Austrian school economists. Uh, and it's, it's, it's challenging, it's interesting, but being a politician in a country like Georgia, uh, which is still a Soviet country, um, I would prefer to fight for full freedom uh, whenever uh, and in which area it is possible. Uh, because uh, what we, I mean, all of our problems is still based on the fact that we still don't have a free society. Uh, and uh, once we become more or less free society, then we can argue uh, where we draw the line, whether the government should finance only military, police, and judiciary, or it should also finance some basic social security net and things like that. But at this moment, when government is involved basically in everything and it's regulating everything, uh, yeah, I would kick out government in any area possible. That's my strategy for, for the uh -huh. moment. Well, I, I think it is an interesting question. I hope um, that that viewer will bring it back to the other discussions that we have here at the Atlas Society and also join us on Clubhouse um, because we have uh, chats there twice a week and we do get to some of these philosophical questions and certainly we can model that in our own personal lives, whether we are politicians or those who are advocating uh, less government to, um, to model uh, and set an example of more individual responsibility in our own lives. So uh, Zurab, thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank you for your time. Hope you get some sleep um, and uh, thank all of you who joined us, all of the excellent questions. Um, if you have been a part of these weekly webinars, we're at number 80. So um, if you're enjoying them, consider supporting the Atlas Society with a tax deductible donation. I wanna wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week again on Clubhouse uh, on Tuesday and on Thursday. And then also we've got our interview with Jeffrey Tucker next Wednesday. So thank you all. <laughs>